Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture Crop Talk webinar series. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question section of the GoToWebinar menu, and we will answer them at the end of each presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to the Manitoba Agriculture YouTube channel shortly after broadcast, and I will share that link with you. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. I'd like to welcome everybody for Crop Talk for October the 2nd. Would have thought by October the 2nd we would be talking about uh, fall work and, and fall fertilizing, but it uh, sounds like we're going to be talking about harvest for a little bit yet. And um, I guess with that, I thought it would be a good idea today to see if we can get Angela Bracker you know, to uh, talk about uh, I guess the remainder of the canola crop that's out there and how things have been uh, doing with that crop and uh, how we can maybe manage the remainder of the crop that's out there and uh, see what she's been seeing and hearing from her colleagues uh, in the canola council. And from that, we're going to go into a bit of a crop update. I uh, starting to get some calls about fall weed control. We've been getting some cool conditions and I uh, thought it would be a good idea to uh, just give a few slides and a bit of a talk as to how to handle uh, cool conditions when you're looking for fall weed control and what to look for and how to manage that. So um, I guess with that, we're going to turn it over to Angela and we're going to talk a little bit about canola. Okay, good morning. Thanks, Lionel. Uh, as Lionel um, said, I kind of wish we were talking about something different, but it is what it is. and. Uh, you know, we've seen, I've, I've always seen how um, impressive it is when producers can figure these, seem to figure these things out better than any of us. And, and I still feel pretty confident that uh, we're going to get this crop off and, uh, and well, and we know there's, there's still a good crop out there um, in, in a lot of areas. But regardless, um, I'm not super enthusiastic to be, to be talking about this today. And, and to be honest, um, don't have a, a pile of, of answers for anyone on, on how we manage this going forward. I, I do want to talk a little bit about um, managing in the bin because we know, um, you know, we've got lots of canola that's not dry in the bin right now and potentially some canola that's going to be going into the bin, not dry. Um, want to just kind of briefly take a look at uh, harvest progress across the prairies and then um, talk a little bit about uh, canola quality concerns and, um, and grading factors. I was in uh, Calgary last week and um, my dad was at home trying to finish my own canola harvest for me and I was feeling kind of crappy about being gone and just like a lot of people not uh, super not super optimistic about the conditions we've been experiencing here in Manitoba. Um, but going out that way made, made me realize, well, things can always be worse. And uh, I, I guess made me feel maybe a little bit better. There is uh, a lot of crop not harvested and a lot of cereal still out, um, really barely touched their canola, a lot of green canola still um, in the Calgary area. And uh, they, of course, just got that snow um, that that we caught a little bit of, but uh, my friend uh, down in Lethbridge sent a picture of <clears throat> her kids making snowmen and doing snow angels. And she figured they'd had like two feet of snow. So um, down down in that area, they've they've got a lot more harvest done, thankfully. But uh, as you move north in, in Alberta, there's a lot of crop that's sitting under a, a pile of snow right now. So uh, the picture on the right there is right around Lethbridge. Um, it doesn't look like that much snow, but all you're seeing is just the very tops of that uh, of that canola crop. So I uh, hesitant to say things could be worse because this isn't super fun, but I guess it could always be worse than it is. OK, so I, I don't have the most recent uh, crop progress updates from Alberta and Saskatchewan but there really wouldn't be much um, of any significance that was done last week. Um, so you can see that uh, if we look at all of Alberta, they're only um, just shy of 12% done their canola. 
the folks out there, I, I really, um, you know, working with the Canal Council really helps me get gain some perspective on this and <clears throat> talk to producers about how to manage because they're certainly more used to this. Um, particularly around the mountains, they they kind of grown accustomed to getting early frosts or or getting snowfalls that um, that eventually melt. Um, and then just generally in the more northern latitudes, you know, their harvest is uh, is more delayed than it is for us down here in the south. So all crops as of uh, last week, 33%. Um, if we compare that to the five-year average, it's definitely down uh, five-year average at 45%. But um, exactly the same shape as they were in last year. And um, I don't think it shows just the year before, but wouldn't really be much different in the year uh, um, compared to the year before either. It's been uh, really a few challenging harvests in a row for uh, folks in, in Alberta, particularly um, central and, and northern Alberta. If we look at Saskatchewan, um, as of last week, 39% done all crops, uh, canola specifically at 17%. Um, again, really changes as you move from the north to the south. Um, same as Manitoba, um, a lot more harvest done down in, in um, the southern latitudes. So 39%, oops, sorry, um, all crops right now in Saskatchewan compared to 62% uh, five-year average. So, you know, a lot more noticeable in Saskatchewan how delayed they are versus, uh, versus Alberta. We look at Manitoba. This was uh, just from the crop report yesterday. We um, at Canola sitting uh, right around 70% for harvest progress in, in 2019. Three year harvest progress average of 84%. This 70% for a lot of folks is going to seem pretty high. Um, if you, you know, as you're the further south you go and the further east you go, um, the more progress has been made. Like in the valley, they are pretty close to done or essentially done. Um, but where I am here, Minidosa, um, you know, it would appear that there's at least 50% of, of the canola still out. And um, I haven't made a trip further north for a while, but I understand um, it would be kind of similar um, up there as well. So definitely um, for Manitoba and for me, uh, this is unusual and, and pretty uncomfortable for us to be uh, still trying to work on that much canola on, uh, on October 2nd. So the big question that I've been getting is, um, what is the quality like of, of this canola sitting there and, um, and from folks who you know, have seen that they still have good quality and are wondering you know, if, if it looks like they're not going to be able to get to it for a while, what's going to happen with it. Um, so I was talking to the CGC because they have their harvest sample program and they don't really have a good feel for this yet because they've had such few samples sent in as compared to normal. So um, I think she was saying they've got somewhere around just over 200 samples where you know, normally by this time they'd have like six, 700. Um, so they, she did say there has been some sprouting in those samples, but um, really too soon to speculate um, the extent to which we're seeing quality um, degradation and it was such a small sample size. So I did just want to touch on this though. Um, we have uh, this information from uh, the, the 2016 harvest where there was uh, so much crop that overwintered in Alberta um, and, uh, and the CGC ran kind of a special program to compare what the samples were like from kind of the, the first go at harvest before the snow came, what samples were like that fall after, um, after the snow kind of became manageable, um, and then what it looked like in the spring when, when folks were, were harvesting. So um, obviously saw some, some quality degradation, but I was pretty surprised how much of that, those samples were still a number one. So um you know this is obviously a different scenario this year but but it does you know maybe provide some optimism that uh that you will still see a lot of good canola 
out there. Of course, you know, we all know or, or expect canola um, and oil seeds to handle this a lot better than, than our cereals will. Um, as the, the lady from the CGC was saying um, to me yesterday, there's just way fewer microbes that, that want to feed on oil and meal as compared to those that feed on carbohydrates. So it's just not as good of a, a host for these microbial communities and, and therefore um, not as prone to deterioration. Um, unfortunately, though, and, and probably why I sound maybe uh, not not super enthusiastic this morning is I, I took a just a random drive around and walked into some fields and was uh, not feeling great after what I saw in the in the swath canola yesterday. So I, I don't know the history of these fields because I was just kind of randomly walking in, just wanted to kind of get a feel for myself what what the quality's like. Um, but I assume, uh, so these are, are mostly around Minidosa, and I assume that uh, they've probably been in the swath for at least three, four plus weeks. Um, so at one point they have been dry. And that's the biggest issue with canola is um, when, when you see sprouting happen is it's been dry and then it gets rewetted, dries, rewetted. Um, and certainly uh, what I saw in those swaths is, is um, you know, some molds, mildews, um, and, and unfortunately quite a bit of sprouting. And, and every, every field I went in had some to a degree, some much worse um, than others. I hate to draw any like general conclusions about this because it was a pretty small sample size. And I was actually talking to Lionel uh, before, the, before we started the broadcast that I, uh, I haven't been getting a lot of calls uh, from people saying that they're seeing this. I've just had more, you know, concerns or people wondering whether it will happen. Um, but I think, you know, field conditions are so bad right now that um, folks aren't even walking into the field. Um, it's it's hard to really um, to even move out there. So so I'm not. Um, it's maybe not too surprising that I haven't had a lot of calls on it yet. So I, I don't. You know, people just maybe uh, don't haven't seen yet uh, what's going on. The picture on the right is actually just from a guy uh, on Twitter that, that I saw um, from from Cypress River, Manitoba, um, and and it's uh, coming across a little bit blurry, but uh, you can see that uh, he's got a crop growing from from the pods, so it's sprouted uh, pretty dramatically in in that uh, in that example. I went into one standing crop that uh, isn't you know, like a lot of the standing crops is not going to be super fun to to manage because it's pretty flat in in spots. Um, but it I, I didn't in that particular um, field that was really close to these swath fields see um, see sprouting. Again, I just want to emphasize. Um, you know, I, I shouldn't really be drawing any big conclusions from this, but uh, but the sample size that I saw didn't make me feel super, uh, super positive. So um, as uh, as it relates to to grading, sprouting is considered damage. Um, so for a number one, uh, you're allowed up to 5% damage and, and sprouting would be a part of that percentage. Uh, number two, 12 percent, and the number three, 25 percent. So anything over that obviously uh, becomes sample. Certainly, um, I would encourage producers to make sure they take samples um, around and, and use uh, the, the CGC's um, service for, for getting samples tested because, you know, when, when we experience weather like this, our buyers tend to be um, a little bit more discriminating when they're looking at samples and, and you know, might just be looking a little bit closer um, than they would in a, in a normal year. So, so just, you know, make sure you, you get a couple opinions. Um, some of these things are, are pretty um, subjective and, and not, uh, you know, not, not super easy to make determinations on. So again, get some, get some different opinions on it and, and, take the time to get a good representative sample um, 
out of the bin or off the field. I don't expect in Manitoba that we're going to have an issue uh, with with green seed. Um, there may be some some areas in Saskatchewan and, or in Alberta, sorry, that that might be an issue, but um, we haven't had super hard frost. And uh, even so, uh, you know, the crop is is mature. Should have been off the field a long time ago if we could have got to it. So that's uh, that's a good thing. So um, as I said, I'm I'm really at this point more concerned with what's happening in the bin and and what are we going to do with this uh, canola once we can finally get out into the field. Um, and some of the questions I'm beginning is okay once we can get out there, um, how high moisture should we be taking off? I'm still uh, you know I'm I'm pretty optimistic that it's going to dry in the field. The once uh, once canola has been dry at one point, it, it's you know that that external moisture drops super quickly and and we do have some sun that's coming in the forecast but um you know it's october 2nd and uh, i certainly wouldn't blame anyone for wanting to go as soon as uh, conditions allow unfortunately um you know we're we're into much shorter days cooler days and we just don't have conditions for natural um, aeration drying at this point. So how high a moisture you should be taking off depends um, how you're set up. You have a dryer, how much can you manage to dry in a day? Um, can you add supplemental heat to your aeration fans? What will the local elevator accept? How many acres do you have to go, et cetera? So, so I don't know that there's a, there's a one size fits all answer here, um, but I mean, people know this because they've been trying to dry grain for the last month and a half and with with aeration and it hasn't really been happening super effectively. Um, so certainly if you're going to be taking anything off over over 10 and 11 percent need to have some kind of plan uh, for trying to get that grain dry. And it's been a really frustrating fall to to do any drying. We just have not had conditions for for natural aeration. The warm days that we did have were like 85 plus percent uh, relative humidity and uh, and you're not going to accomplish any drying really once um, once you're above 70 percent relative humidity um, it's pretty unlikely that you're accomplishing any drying what this is is a equilibrium moisture chart um, specific to canola so basically it shows you um, the temperature of the air that you're blowing and its relative humidity and what what moisture content canola will equilibrate to if if that exact same air is blown on it for a period of time. So so really, if you look at these charts, it shows you why supplemental heat is so effective. Um, it for for every ten degree increase in in temperature that you're blowing, you basically cut the relative humidity in half. So you you give that air so much more capacity to uh, to hold moisture. So if we are taking off tough or damp canola, um, if possible, underfill any bin, bin space that you have. Um, keep the aeration fans on, even if it's not accomplishing drying. Um, turn the bulk frequently, of course, monitor diligently. And I really uh, discourage folks from, from blending with dry canola. Um, try and uh, you know, get your buyers to do a paper blend rather than, when, than physically blend. Um, I just get really concerned that you know, now we're taking our good canola and potentially putting it at risk of, of spoilage. And, and again, be set up to, to add heat to that drying process. I think supplemental heat is, uh, is a really underutilized tool, particularly Manitoba. Um, you know, it's just not really something that we're, we're used to having to, to deal with. Um, but, it, but it's a super effective way to extend our, our drying season. It, it uh, certainly has limitations, though. We, with supplemental heat, so we're talking about like adding, uh, adding a heater to the fan. I'm not talking about like high heat drying. Um, you really can heat the air no more than like um, 10 to, to 15 at the most 20 degrees. Um, so if we look back or think back to that chart, I was just showing you air that's 10 degrees or less, basically is no drying capacity at all. So the, the use of supplemental heat is, is really only an option 
when we're still above zero outside. Um, so, so when we're we're doing this, um, it really important. I mean, it's always important that that we have adequate airflow um, of our aeration fans for for even accomplishing um, cooling or or uh, natural air drying. But even more important when when we're adding supplemental heat, so we're not actually like physically baking the canola at the at the bottom and like inducing heating. Um, so airflow of at least 0.75 um, CFM per bushel and uh, you know closer to one would be would be better and then um, once you've done this uh, and accomplished the drying that you want to accomplish aerate uh, to cool the other thing um, that that we saw from some work pammy did uh, in wheat but i think we can we can assume the same in canola is that we need to um, turn fairly frequently when when we're doing this um, because it just takes a really long time for that front to move all the way um, up the bin. So um, the EMC charts would lead you, to, lead you to believe that you know you could dry with with 10 degree air at at low relative humidities, and and you can, but it would take like a year for that to happen. So so warmer air just dries way faster. So if you can warm up the air to 18, 20 degrees Celsius, that's going to dry five times faster than air at 10, 12 degrees Celsius. I've had some questions on, on hot air drying. Um, if you're taking canola off extremely damp, you might want to consider drying in two cycles. It just seems like the more moisture you're trying to take off, uh, bring down in one cycle, the more damage that, uh, that you do to that canola. If you have um, questions on this, we have some information on um, on our canola encyclopedia in the storage section, and Pammy has some some good information um, as well. One thing um, that's that's a good trick or tool uh, with hot air drying is is make sure when once you're done, uh, put it back into the bin and blow cold air on it, and you can actually accomplish. Um, like a point more more drying by blowing cold air onto onto warm grain. Okay, so based on that, um, what would be the upper moisture content limit to, to take off? Um, again, I really hope that we don't have to deal with this too much, but uh, but just in case and to be prepared, if you if you are drying with with a hot air dryer and you want to limit uh, that drying to one cycle, probably don't want to take anything off over 14, 15 percent. If you want to use supplemental heat, it's just going to depend on the forecast. So do you have three to five days in a row where you could get temperatures up to 15 to 20 degrees adding that uh, that supplemental heat? And if so, then, you know, we'd be OK taking anything off in that 12% um, um, range. I also um, have, have learned to become more comfortable with uh, just utilizing cold temperatures to our advantage after uh, the couple years of, of folks in, in Alberta and Saskatchewan, where they just kind of gave up in, in the fall, put canola that was really uncomfortably high moisture, put it in the bin, cooled it off and, and kept blowing the fans every time it got cooler outside to eventually <clears throat> freeze it and, uh, and, and really maintain that the quality of that bulk until they could until they got to the spring where they could you know utilize the warmer days to to dry in the spring there's obviously risks involved uh involved there because if it ever does start to warm up if you've got 12 13 14 percent canola in the bin um you know it it's pretty volatile but uh, but certainly that has worked really well for a lot of folks I'm not going to get into this too much, and and I I hesitate to to talk about it um, too much. Anyways, it's uh, it's showing us with with moisture contents and and storage temperatures how long it's safe in the bin. This again is on our canola encyclopedia if you want to take a look at it. Um, but the problem with a lot of storage work is it's done in homogeneous type conditions in small. Um, cylinders or or small bench scale type bins so very different conditions than than what we're dealing with um, on in like field scale commercial bins the moral of the story here is um 
we need to be closely monitoring this canola. So even, even if the canola that we're dealing right with right now that's in the field, even if it um, gets dry to eight to 10%, there's a lot more microbial activity. Um, if there's any sprouting at all, uh, it's just way, way riskier in, in storage. So we need to be watching it really, really closely. Keeping the fans on will help to break up any potential um, hotspots that have, that have started. So um, that's, that's, you know, managing it once it gets into the bin. Um, but I, I think at this point, getting across the field could be the biggest issue for, for a lot of folks. It's actually amazing to me what we have been able to cross uh, already when, you know, drive across with your pickup truck and, and uh, you got to, you know, keep, keep your foot down and uh, keep it in four wheel drive to, to make it. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing to me that, that we can get across with a hopper full of, uh, of grain, but certainly, um, you know, fields are, are pretty saturated and we haven't had conditions to, to really accomplish any drying at all. Um, one advantage of canola's, canola being down in a swath is, um, you know, there's a lot more, a lot more air movement and uh, the sun can get at um, more of that field and, and hopefully will dry up a little bit faster than, than some of the sanding stuff. But again, I don't have the answers for this and, and farmers um, are better at figuring this out than, than anybody. I've seen you know, a lot of my neighbors hauling off the field uh, with the grain cart, keeping the trucks off the field completely, you know, trying, to, trying to find ways to, to keep the trucks on the road and, and dump um, you know, from the field onto the road. So not, not super fun, but uh, there's ways that we can, we can work around this. And I just really hoping at this point that, uh, that things start to dry up for us. So, like I said, I don't really have uh, any awesome answers for anyone. I really hope that what I was seeing around uh, Minidosa isn't, uh, isn't the case for all of the canola that's out there. Um, but certainly uh, encourage folks to be, you know, be talking to their buyers and, <clears throat> and figure out what, uh, what tolerance there might be and what markets there might be um, for any off, uh, off spec canola. And just want to wish everybody good luck as we uh, hopefully get back into the field in, in the next, uh, in the coming days here. Okay, thanks, Angela. Um, I do have a couple of questions that came in. Um, one is regarding the strike cut canola, and uh, this was a sown, I guess, a little bit later, so it hadn't been sprayed yet. Um, is it still something that they should be looking at doing, or should they be looking at swapping it? So the sorry, Lionel. The question is: It's uh, standing canola was never sprayed, and they're wondering should they spray it or swath it? Yeah. Okay. So um, at this point in the season. A lot of the uh, pre-harvest herbicides that we would use, or, or all of them really, are going to be fairly ineffective, really slow um, working, and um, you know it's already October second. We just don't have the day length uh, or the heat to encourage efficacy of those products. We have had. Um, a little bit of frost, and uh, and that will certainly help to desiccate that canola, and and just having been out there through all this adverse weather, drying and rewetting, encourages like saprophytic growth and and molds and stuff that help to dry down pod material and stock material. So I my instinct would be, I mean it's hard to say when I haven't seen this this example, but my instinct is just you just got to leave it um, really adding another operation with the swather could just make a mess of of things um, and if it if it looks like a lot of the standing canola that I've seen um, is not going to be an easy field to swath okay and then I guess the follow-up to that question they were wondering if if it is lodged really bad, um, is sprouting something they might have to worry about? And I guess so I'll let you answer that, yeah. 
Yeah, so again, I don't have a great handle on this yet, but um, from, I guess what I've seen um, around my own farm and around Minidosa, it doesn't look as though it's going to be as bad. Um, just a little bit more airflow, not as densely packed as a swath. Um, but, you know, we'll just kind of have to wait and see. I shouldn't really speculate too much. Hi, Angela, it's Lori. It looks like Lionel might be offline for a moment. Um, I think what we can do is, uh, if you have can um, share a little bit more until I see he's back on, that would be great. Sure, yeah. Um, I, I, I think um, we've, we're, we probably have more swath canola um, this year in Manitoba and really across the prairies than, uh, than we've had in the past. We actually have uh, Prairie Agriculture Machinery Institute has been out uh, trying to do some, some lot harvest loss sampling for us. Of course, uh, didn't pick an easy year to try and accomplish that, uh, but we wanted to get a representative sample of you know, all, all different uh, types of, of combines, whether it's a, a rotary or conventional or John Deere or case um, and you know a representation of swath versus straight cut and at, at this point they have the majority of the fields they've been working in um, have been swath so that's uh, you know definitely something different this year and uh, I think people kind of reverted back to the swather to try and manage some of the the differences in maturity and um, you know things were were just kind of uncomfortably late and and so people you know swathing to try and maybe hurry things along a little bit um so you know i i get the question a lot and we talk about a lot what's what's worse in this scenario of of snow or or rain to be down in a swath or or to be standing and of again not really an answer for that i think um you know being swath like i said before um the, the ground will hopefully dry out faster than than the standing stuff. Um, but you know certainly seen already this fall that um, it's it the stand the, the moisture content of the the standing stuff drops quicker after um, the weather event after things kind of turn around. So um, can get back into that into the canola because of the moisture content itself, but the field conditions may be maybe the limiting factor of, of the standing stuff. As far as quality goes though, um, really too soon to tell how big of a difference between the standing and the swath. Um, but yeah, I mean, everybody's probably pretty aware what, what that swath feels like down um, in the middle or in, in the bottom, particularly, you know, some of the, the wider swaths that, uh, that we're dealing with. I would also okay. just re-emphasize that. Uh, oh, sorry, Lionel. I would just re-emphasize that at, at this point, I wouldn't. I would really discourage folks from from trying to swath anything that's that's standing. Um, you know, it's not going to be fun to manage it. I watched last year one of my neighbors straight cutting their their canola all the same direction, um, but uh, you know, adding another operation, I don't think is. Uh, is a great way um, to manage that and just you know with the way that the straight cut stuff is or the standing stuff is lodged in all sorts of different directions it would just be a, a really difficult thing to to lay down a, a nice even windrow yeah i agree with you angela i think uh the biggest issue is going to be moisture and where the moisture or where the bad spots up spots are in the field right now so i think uh It'd be benefit to, to the producers' benefits uh, just to keep uh, trying to do it as straight cut as they originally intended. Yeah, yeah. One of the one of the things we were kind of maybe laughing about is being in a swath might be a little bit better to so you can actually see what's coming up ahead of you. <laughs> um, I I know that we've had I've had some of my neighbors stuck, and I know I know that uh, they're not the only ones. There's been quite a few combines stuck out in the fields. And when you're dealing with, with standing crop, you just don't really know what's what's up ahead. So that might be another advantage of, of the stuff that's down in a windrow. 
Okay, well, thanks a lot, Angela. Uh, that was some uh, good information and uh, good insight as to what's happening, I guess, uh, to the west of us as well. So uh, thanks for being on today. Uh, it was uh, some really good information. Thanks, Lionel. Okay, so uh, I mentioned at the beginning that I was getting some questions regarding fall weed control and uh, and the cool temperatures. So I thought uh, I'd maybe go through a few uh, things that uh, I talked to with producers regarding fall weed control and uh, just kind of a, a little bit of update as to what we can do to uh, make this uh, or make the products work a little bit better for us. So I guess the big thing, uh, the keys to fall weed control is the first thing would be scouting. Uh, go out there and see what you're actually looking at or what you have for weeds out there. And what are you trying to control? Are they mainly annuals? Are they perennials? Or are they winter annuals? Because I think there's different strategies for controlling uh, these uh, the, the different kinds of weeds out there. And even rates and application timings are important for the different ones. So uh, we'll go through a few of those. Uh, to get started with, we'll uh, we'll look at the annuals and uh, really for annual weeds, um, and if that's all you have out in the field, uh, really not, no treatments are really required right now because uh, those weeds are uh, are so far behind uh, before they'll produce seed that uh, they'll be uh, they'll be hit by a killing frost or or by uh, by winter before they even have the potential to reproduce seed. However, um, there is an opportunity in the fall to get some of those, uh, those annuals and sometimes the annual uh, weeds can be your, uh, your volunteer canolas or your volunteer crops. So it's a good opportunity to get some of those volunteer canolas growing and uh, get them germinated in the fall. So this way you kind of start your weed control for the following year. Uh, a lot of producers are under tight rotations where they're got a wheat canola soybean rotation or something very similar to that and running into issues with uh, volunteer canola coming up in in soybeans especially what is one of the ones we see see a fair bit and uh, this is the time of year where you can get those canola seeds germinating with uh, light harrowing or even a, a light pro tilling or one of those type of operations just to get uh, get them going and uh, we're even seeing that with a lot of the barley crops this year. We're seeing a lot of stubbles greening up and uh, we'll be able to, you know, get rid of some of those uh, seed bank for, for next year. The other thing too is uh, with the fall, uh, you know, uh, fall applied herbicides, you can actually uh, uh, do the same thing. You stimulate weed growth, but you're actually uh, getting prepared for next year as well because you're putting on a, a product that might help you in controlling resistance in fields. And I just put edge up for an example, as a lot of uh, producers uh, are starting to look at some of these products again as part of their weed management program. And uh, going back to whether it be uh, uh, surface applied and just, uh, you know, with a light, a light harrowing with a Velmar uh, on your harrow bar uh, in the fall to uh, uh, an incorporation. So we're seeing, uh, we're seeing a couple different methods of, of applying some of these, uh, these herbicides, but uh, either or both of those methods of applying the herbicide will help in controlling some of your annual weeds. So if annual weeds are your big problem, uh, really uh, uh, the cold weather will eventually take care of them. Perennial weeds, uh, well, fall is a great time for managing perennial weeds. And I guess if you haven't done or weren't able to do a pre-harvest to control some of those, uh, those weeds uh, uh, after harvest, it gives you the opportunity to do that as well. Uh, lower temperatures uh, trigger the plants to start moving carbohydrates into the root system. So by spraying these weeds in the fall, uh, you're getting the kind of the best movement of chemical through the plant and into the root systems because they kind of just take a take a ride with the carbohydrates down to the roots and are able to get a better kill that way. Um, some research actually even shows that uh, cooler temperatures will actually give you a better kill because the cooler temperatures will uh, make the plant think that it needs to start uh, you know, moving uh, nutrients to the roots and gives it a better opportunity for the, uh, the chemical to get down there. However, 
we need to distinguish between a light frost and a killing frost, and I'm going to get into that a little bit later as in the in the, in this in this part of the presentation. As we you know, and and timing and staging is important when you're looking at perennials. And when you look at the pictures on the side, you can see uh, uh, the bottom picture here is uh, Canada thistle, and you can see what happens after. Uh, swathing or straight cutting, you usually clip it off and it needs to get some regrowing done. Uh, plants usually look a little bit different than they do when they're uh, in a, done in a pre-harvest situation because they're a more fuller plant. But you need to wait to see about four, maybe five leaves on that Canada thistle before you need to go, or before you're going to get any kind of bang for your buck when you go in to do some, uh, some fall weed control. Uh, dandelions again another one that uh, some producers are looking at uh, getting control of at this time of year and again it's uh, you need some good regrowth uh, dandelions a little bit different than thistles they tend to grow a little bit closer to the ground so they're uh, maybe a little bit easier to get control of and uh, but uh, for Canada thistle you need to get some uh, you know at least that four leaves five would be better uh, before you go out there and spray after cutting them um, another weed or another uh, one that producers are usually looking at is quackgrass and uh, I usually went by the method if you see enough regrowth that it'll cover the, the length of your hand uh, that there's enough material there for the, the plant to take up uh, take up roots or take up the chemical and, and get some decent control so uh, regrowth and timing is uh, regrowth is, uh, is an important factor when when looking at the perennial weeds. Our winter annuals, um, they've been coming more and more of a problem for, uh, for producers. Um, and I think it's something that we need to be watching because as we um, look at growing some crops where uh, the potential for controlling some of these isn't as easy in the spring, uh, we need to start looking at controlling them in the fall. And some of the weeds are starting to get to become very hard to, hard to kill in the spring. Uh, they get a little bit bigger uh, and uh, by the time we get in there for uh, a burn off uh, you know you're needing to add different products uh, to get the get these weeds or if you leave it longer than that by the time you do in crop spraying they're way too big to get control of and basically you're going to deal with them for the rest of the year um, september to october again the best time for controlling these ones uh, but you need to uh, look at the field before and see what's out there before spraying. Uh, there is a little bit of difference in tolerance to, to frost with some of these uh, weeds. And I just put a little chart there on the bottom that I found where it shows uh, the first weed on the left-hand side is uh, night flowering catchfly, then cleavers, chickweed, shepherd's purse, then stinkweed, and then narrow leaves hawksbeard. And you can see as it goes to the right, they're uh, more, more tolerant to cold. Um, I think one of the things we need to uh, address this year too is because we've had uh, quite a few days now of cooler cooler than uh, normal temperatures for harvest uh, and uh, we've had some evenings where we've had uh, uh, minus ones, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, some of these weeds have start to, started to harden off. They've been getting, uh, you know, the cooler growing uh, uh, cooler growing temperatures and because of that they've hardened off and they're able to handle the cool conditions so some of these uh if you've checked in your fields be, uh, you know a week ago 10 days ago and didn't weren't seeing too many things happening out there probably wouldn't be a bad idea to go back out there and check these fields again because uh as i mentioned uh, as they're more tolerant to some of the cool conditions they'll be able to handle colder evenings and uh the killing frost that we usually talk about might may may need to be colder than minus four or minus five this year to get some of these or to actually kill some of these off for the, for the winter. So a little bit about frost, and uh, I'm going to talk about a light frost first. And uh, there's a uh, you know light frost. Usually discussions are held between zero and minus three degrees Celsius, and uh, and these only do minimal damage to a lot of the perennials and the winter an winter annual weeds. Um, you know, uh, the biggest thing we always talk about as well is the timing. Uh, 
I think about a week ago now, we had a frost that started at about uh, one o'clock in the morning and went through till about 8.30 the following morning, like 8.30. So we had about eight hours of, uh, of frost. So the, the, the duration of the frost also is important to monitor. Uh, I think the biggest thing you still need to do is go out there, um, you know, a day after, a couple days after and assess the damage that is done. Um, you know, usually with a light frost, you could go out and spray the following day if the, the temperatures get up to like 10 degrees for a couple hours. Now, again, it, depending on the duration, if it's uh, a light frost from, you know, for two hours or something like that, then I think that statement would apply. Um, and, uh, you know, I always uh, err on the side of giving those plants an extra day and then going out and, and, and hitting them then. And then you know that uh, you're gonna get some uh, some good regrowth at that time period. And uh, the, you'll know that if the plants are, are actually uh, uh, made it through the frost event that we had. With a heavier frost, so frost more than minus four degrees Celsius, uh, the recommendations you know, are to you know wait two or three days and then go out and, and see. Uh, how much damage has been done by the frost. Um, more than likely you're going to see damage because anything over minus four is going to cause uh, breaking of cells in the plants. So you're going to see, uh, you know, browning, uh, at least a dark green uh, uh, kind of color starting to show on those plants. And uh, your goal or your role then is going to try to figure out how much damage has been done. Um, if there's still, you know, 50 to 60% of those plants are still green or still, uh, um, you know, still uh, actively growing, uh, then you're, the potential to do some spraying is still there. And I think the biggest thing I always tell guys to watch for is see if there's some new leaves that are going to start uh, coming out, uh, especially on a Canada thistle. Uh, you'll see a new leaf uh, in by, you know, three days after if you still see some new leaves coming then you know that uh, that plant is still uh, still functioning and still able to take in some chemical. Biggest thing too is when you do go to spray is spraying, you know, when the temperature has rebounded and, you know, you got 10 degrees Celsius or more for at least two hours of the day. And in this case, after a severe frost, one of the things you need to remember is that um, we might get more frost uh, happening. And if that's the case, probably you're not going to see a lot of benefits to spraying. So make sure that uh, you've made it through that, that cold frost period, you've got regrowth, and there's going to be no frost for the next couple of days after spring. That'll help you get uh, get control of some of the harder to, will, harder to uh, kill weeds, especially if we get a, a killing frost. So fall weed control can be touchy, uh, you know, when you're going to spray because uh, you want to get the uh, product into that plant and get it down into the root systems. Uh, products will, uh, re products results will vary depending on the time of day. I mentioned 10 degrees Celsius uh, for at least a couple hours. Well, normally you're going to see that uh, kind of during the heat of the day. So it's probably spraying early mornings or evenings, uh, probably not a good idea. Uh, at least spraying from that one o'clock to four o'clock or five o'clock in the afternoon is going to be your window for doing uh, spraying. Um, conditions before and after the frost, I know I mentioned uh, hardening off of plants, but also is there going to be more frost in the forecast? So you need to be aware of that. Uh, regrowth, uh, we talked about that. Then the other thing I think that we need to uh, look at is, uh, is rates. Um, one of the things uh, when you're looking at uh, only say 50% or 60% of that plant still uh, available for control or getting control of those weeds, you may in some cases need to increase some of the rates you're using. Uh, you know, you're definitely not wanting to go with uh, a half rate or a three quarter rate. You probably want to do the leader to maybe even a little bit more uh, to get better control of some of these weeds. Uh, surfactants uh, would definitely be something you want to uh, continue to use. Uh, if anything, it helps keep the chemical on the plant for a longer period of time to help in the absorption as well as, uh, as getting into the plant. So uh, again, things you should uh, be, uh, be looking at doing if you're uh, spraying, after, especially after frost situations. 
So that's a little bit about uh, what to look for when, uh, or what I usually look for when I'm talking to producers regarding spraying in the fall and uh, spraying after frost events. And I think uh, one of the things uh, we probably haven't had uh, a major killing frost yet, uh, and actually I can show you um, some of the temperatures, the minimum temperatures we've seen in the Southwest here. And you can see a lot of the temperatures are, you know, anywhere from that, uh, minus 1.5 to I think the worst would be right around the Rhiney Mountain National Park where they were you know minus six a couple or one night there uh, so uh, those areas where they were that high you know they definitely need to be aware of what they're doing some of these other areas uh, have uh, haven't received uh, really cold evenings yet so uh, uh, the potential, I think, for still doing some spraying is there. Again, every field is going to be different. Every area is going to be different. So you definitely need to be monitoring your fields. Looking at our growing degree days here, uh, we're definitely uh, still behind the eight ball this year. And you can see that in, uh, especially in the corn right now, you can see that, that some of those crops uh, have been hit by frost uh, and are touched by frost lately. And they're... Uh, starting to ripen in but they're just uh just not quite we're able to finish this year so we're going to see some effects on our on our silage and grain corn i think the majority of the other crops have uh, have done okay and with the rainfall events we had over the last week to 10 days you can see our numbers have gone up substantially from where we were a couple months ago going back to the uh beginning slide here uh was this picture was taken yesterday morning uh I was uh, out looking at some of the uh, fields from the, the snow event that we had. Uh, the, the snow event maybe didn't come as, go as far south as uh, as number one highway. I think, uh, you know, the Brandon area did receive some, but a lot of the standing crops uh, did get lodged. Uh, this was a field of wheat uh, uh, right around 16 highway that uh, was, was taken down by uh, some pretty heavy snowfall. Probably three to four inches, I think, in some areas was... Uh, was what I was hearing and uh, amounts uh, uh, of wet snow and that's what the big thing was there. There was a, a hail event that occurred too uh, south of, uh, of number, uh, number two highway and uh, it uh, affected a fair bit of canola whether it was standing or, uh, or in the swath and here's just a picture of one of the fields and you can see a lot of the the pods on top uh, got affected uh, from talking to producers in that area. You know, guys are estimating anywhere between 30 to 50% uh, yield loss uh, from, uh, from, uh, from that event that went through. And that was uh, last, early last week that, uh, that that happened. This is a field uh, straight cut canola and that was uh, in the um, uh, Minidosa area, I think, and uh, I was uh, there and after the snow here too, and you can see where uh, um, it uh, definitely lodged a lot of the canola and is gonna make harvest interesting. And I think Angela uh, talked a lot about that today as to how producers are gonna have to deal with some of these crops. And I uh, went by that field again after the snow melted off and uh, it uh, wasn't bouncing back. I think a lot of the straw was fairly brittle at that time period and the weight was enough to bring it down and it probably isn't going to come back up already for, for this year. Angela mentioned this or showed this in her presentation. And this is our harvest progress uh, for the province right now. We're about 67% complete. I think the canola number, as Angela mentioned, is going to vary quite a bit depending on where you are in the province. Uh, talking to uh, guys on the eastern side of the province and in the valley, they're pretty much done. But uh, as you move west uh, and north, uh, the percentage is probably going to drop. Uh, and uh, as Angela mentioned, probably closer to that 50%. That, uh, then as you go kind of south of number two highway, a lot more canola has been done as well. So that's where the number for the 69 comes from. And um, again, a lot of harvest to be done. I think uh, one of the biggest things is, uh, is quality is gonna be the biggest issue. Uh, this was put out uh, last Monday and it showed uh, kind of the, the three prairie provinces where we sit for harvest. And I think you could probably add about 10% or less to each of these numbers for what we were able to do last week. So, you know, right in that 65 
you know, 45, you know, maybe 40% range for, for the province, which is kind of uh, concerning when we consider we're into uh, October. And then uh, this was also put out by the, put out at the same time and just kind of a rough value of, of what it's worth. And they put it at uh, $350 per acre. And I think depending on the crop, uh, you know, we definitely could be seeing uh, that dollar amount to uh, a lot more that's out there right now. So uh, definitely needing some weather conditions to help us uh, get the rest of this uh, this crop in. And there's uh, just another example of some of the questions we've been getting as to what to do with some of the the swath crop out there that's sprouted quite a, quite bad and and severely. And uh, I think producers are going to have to be making a decision here as things warm up as to how. It, how we're going to manage uh, some of these cereal crops that are left out there. Regarding the seasonal crop reports, uh, again, they, they are still continuing. Uh, the reports maybe aren't, uh, besides the, uh, the crop report as to harvest conditions, uh, the rest of the reports are kind of winding down because most of the disease and insect issues have kind of slowed down, but those reports are still being put up on our website. Uh, hay listings and managing low forage supplies. Uh, I think these are critical things that are happening right now uh, for producers that don't have cattle that may have some cereal crops that are still out there. Uh, definitely start thinking about what you're going to do with those, if, uh, especially if they're in a swath and look like this one slide I showed. Uh, there may be some potential for hay there and maybe a potential for you to uh, get some extra dollars out of, uh, out of that field. There is going to be uh, some meetings coming up on stretching your feed supplies to feed your herd. Uh, these are the, the days that they're going to be uh, happening in, in different areas throughout the province. Uh, so if you're a beef producer that's looking at shortage of feed or just even looking at different options for feeding this year, I've been getting some questions regarding that as well. Uh, definitely uh, take a, one of these events in. Also, uh, for producers that are uh, looking at different types of feed this year, we do have uh, staff that are helping, are able to help you do feed rations. So give your local office a call or if, uh, if you have questions regarding that. Environmental farm plan meetings, uh, they are continuing on and there's a number of them that are gonna be happening uh, in October, November and December. There has been some announcements regarding programs under the environmental farm plan. So if you need to take your course, uh, this is uh, basically dates and locations. If you want more information, uh, I would advise you to call uh, your local office or call the 1-800 number that's, uh, that's uh, listed here and uh, you'll be able to get more information as uh, the location in say in Brandon where it's gonna be located uh, and, and, uh, and you can register as well. With the wet conditions, uh, crop control burning hasn't been too much of an issue, but every day it's listed. So I think if you're going to do some burning, you still need to be careful as to when and where you're doing it. So definitely check on that. If you have questions regarding anything that's happening on the farm, um, please uh, give these people a call. They, uh, they're working fairly hard for, to help you uh, get your answers. So uh, don't be scared to call them. And our next uh, uh, webinar is scheduled for October the 9th. Um, what will probably happen, it'll be uh, similar to uh, this week. Uh, uh, we, might, uh, we might postpone this one and, and follow it up with one afterwards. We'll see how harvest is going. And, uh, but right now it's scheduled for October the 9th and you'll be getting something regarding whether it's being canceled or, uh, or whether it's on. So thanks again for attending. If there is uh, no questions, I think we'll end it for this week.